Hi, everybody. We're wrapping up day two of CDO IQ, the Cube's coverage. Uh, this is the analyst angle. I'm here with Paul Gillen and Sanjeev Mohan, the two co-hosts, along with myself this week. This is the 18th annual CDO IQ conference. It is the premier chief data officer event comprised of uh, CDOs from healthcare, uh, government, financial services, and broadly the industry. Uh, the CDO role used to be really focused on highly regulated industries. That changed, oh, I don't know, five, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and this conference, again, 18 years, started out with 20, 30 people and has grown over 700 people this year. And um, this is the eighth year the Cube has covered this. Guys, uh, thanks so much for hosting with us today and You're yesterday. Welcome. And um, let's talk about what we learned. I guess, uh, you know, I'll kick it off. I, I think the, the CDO role continues to emerge as a more important role. The whole idea of bringing the chief data and analytics officer together, that's clearly something mm -hmm. that's happened over the last several years. Um, and now it's going beyond that with AI. But I guess my bottom line takeaway is, as I, as I was saying earlier, I think it's just getting messier and messier yeah. with the governance challenges, the AI confusion that's coming into the marketplace, yeah. the risks associated Correct. with that. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's an increasingly important role, but a harder one. And remember yeah. the old, you know, career is over. It's, you know, <laughs> it's you could be headed to, to yeah. a similar, yeah. you know, fast yeah. succession. But what are your thoughts? So Dave, the confusion and complication, complexity of what's uh, happening is not just uh, from one aspect or the other, it's across the board. As a technologist, you know we've talked about it uh, ad nauseum, how the technologies are changing. But even if we keep the technologies uh, aside, you look at organizational or you look at processes, massive confusion. For example, we said CDO to become successful should become CDAO, and now we are saying should it be CDA, AIO, AIO yeah. you know, so so e -I -E -I -O. Just, yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, and then of course uh, this uh, all these uh, uh, different aspects are so intermingled that uh, the CDO cannot uh, work in isolation; has to work with the CISO, has to work with CTO, with the CIO, and uh, and people are like confused. Who should I go talk to? So the businesses still have a same problem. Their problem hasn't changed. What is their problem? How do I get access to data as fast as it's produced in a trusty, trustworthy manner? That has not changed. Instead, we have created this, uh, a, a, a mass of different organizations and roles and processes. And so I think this confusion needs to be tamed at some point. Yeah, I agree with Sanjeev. I, uh, one thing that struck me is how little has changed in yes. 10 years. Uh, you, know, you go back to 10 yeah. years when we were doing this event and the CDO was, role was just emerging and the whole question was, well, what is this job? What do yeah. these people do? Is this a, an IT function? Is it a business function? Is it a, is it a uh, regulatory function? And uh, you know, I was struck by Tom Davenport's survey that he, that he talked about uh, today of how they surveyed CDOs and found that those same issues are still there. There's still yeah. a lot of, of uh, uh, ambiguity about what the CD role is, whether it should in involve analytics and AI, who's in charge of AI, and I would expect that after, <laughs> after a decade, these issues would be worked out, but they don't seem to be uh, yeah, resolved. I, so I have a theory, if you look at uh, the tagline or the business description of a ultra modern BI tool today, something that just came into existence and you compare it with what business objects were saying in <laughs> 1990, it would be exactly the same. Hmm. The outcome is certainly the same. Yeah. It might be easier to deploy. Correct. You know, because it's yeah, cloud-based. Yeah, but that's and, yes, about the only difference. Yes, right? correct. It's not in your laptop anymore, it's in the cloud. Yes. It's that blow. Right. <laughs> right. right. And, and these issues persist despite the fact that the technology foundation has changed dramatically right. with the emergence of, of uh, you know, open source table formats and, and catalogs and generative AI. And these issues, if, it, have, if anything, made the CDO's job more complex. Yeah, so um, I was uh, trying to explain to my family about this table format wars that oh, were going on, they're not technical. Yeah. So I was like, how do I explain to them? So um, I have two daughters, 
and uh, my family is uh, deeply into Mamma Mia, the the ABBA uh, yeah. thing. So in that, there's a famous scene where this girl she says, "All my life, I've waited for my dad to show up, and three of them show up." <laughs> So I was like, well, all of a sudden, we got iceberg, hoodie, and delta. Yeah. <laughs> Which one should I pick? <laughs> Will the true dad show up? I love them all. Right. So, you know, it's funny, Paul, you said so, so much has stayed the same, and it's true. But I remember the first CDO IQ conference I, I did. It was just detailed research, kind of back office stuff on data quality. Mm. Um, and the, so the difference is that's now come to the front office uh, because of the importance of data governance. Um, and the other difference is the crowd is much bigger. You have way more CDOs yeah. here. And the other, the other, uh, the, the third difference is you got a lot more vendors here because they're trying to sell to those individuals. Mm -hmm. So the, the CDO role has emerged as a much stronger influencer. Now, the problems are still the same. Uh, and as you say, the technologies have changed dramatically, which to me underscores the fact that people always say, well, it's not the technology that you gotta, go, gotta worry about, it's the people, the process, the organization. I know, you kind of roll your eyes because we always hear that, but, but it's kind of true. Um, and so, the question is where do we go from here, right? Yeah. We, we, I, I really do believe that it's just gonna get more and more complex. Yeah. And I think that organizations um, are gonna have real challenges trying to get their entire data estate together. This is where I, we were talking about Pat McGovern earlier. We had lived by the mantra of a decentralized organization back when we were in our IDG days. And you can almost see it's very inefficient, right? Yeah. In, in a way, because you don't have a single source of truth. Lots of duplication. Organization. So, Tons of yeah. duplication. But, but maybe it's more effective, you know, just to, to live with that. <laughs> so I, it's, it's an enigma. Uh, data has, uh, I've been a data practitioner for a few decades now. We used to live in a silo. I used to, I started my career at Oracle. And so I would write PL SQL stored procedure and I would literally just write it and just put it into, uh, into action. There was no discipline around it. So now, we, uh, I, I'm a huge believer, I've written a book on data products because I, I think applying product management discipline is super important. Applying software development lifecycle uh, best practices, what we call DevOps, is super important. So when you have all of these best practices applied to data, data becomes a lot more compelling. Yet, you go downstairs and you talk to the vendors and they're struggling to make inroads into uh, their buyers, pros prospects. So there's so much noise. Prospects are like, I'm getting bombarded by different vendors all the time. I refuse to even check my email and pick up my phone because some vendor will be knocking on my door. So that's enigma. Because we've got the best practice now in place and yet, uh, like graph databases. We know graph databases are amazing. They're very intuitive. The way you think is the way you data model it and it's very accurate. But how many graph databases do we know? That are successful. Yeah, right, right. And so, and and ask a customer to bu to buy a graph database. That's like they're going to throw you out of their office. Yeah, exactly. And say, give me yes. a solution. Give me a solution. You know, if you want to yeah. use a graph database, yeah. that's fine. Right. You know, but I don't right. want to know what's right. under the cover. So this is what's interesting, is you know we've been following AWS for years. Correct. We heard from them yesterday. Uh, you know, basically start in small pockets. You know, don't worry about, you know, cons there's actually some pragmatism there. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it's self-serving because they have all these pockets. Yeah. Right? We heard from Microsoft, they had a, a, a talk, you were there Monday night. Right? Yes, I, I think, was, The correct. whole purview thing. Yes. And that seemed to resonate with some people. Yes. Oh, great, you know, keep it federated. And, right. But then we heard even from Microsoft, yeah. uh, their own internal challenges yeah. of trying to virtualize data yeah. didn't, didn't perform well. Correct. So yes. they had to th re rethink that. That's a good yeah. example of a large right. company right. You know, struggling with this. And so that's why I say I think it's just going to continue to get more and more complex. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, boiling the ocean is rarely a, rarely a good business strategy. Right. And I think we, well, one thing we heard consistently today, John Sands of, of ThoughtWorks uh, talked about it, is that you have to take a piecemeal approach. You have to start small, you have to show success, you have to, to demonstrate to others the virtues of, of, of taking a, a structured approach, and then that begins to proliferate the, throughout the organization. Problem is it takes years for that to happen, and during that time there's a yeah. lot of turnover, 
the change it's at the ball, top, change yeah, in the middle, yeah. and so the you, you lose momentum when, when the organization changes. So Paul, I have so little patience for uh, when people talk about these things because I'm like, you're stating the obvious. Yes, focus on the business value, start small. Uh, if it was that simple, why haven't we cracked the nut? So, so you see, so I, I, and I, there's some disconnect because you know, like people keep saying, have data literacy, have the right data culture, but how? Uh, you know, that to, that is something which we have still struggle at. Well, I think, uh, I, I think having said that, if you do small projects, you actually can get outcomes. You can lower the oh, risk. Oh, hundred percent, yes, and, and that's yes. how people yeah. approach it. The problem is those projects all have. Yeah, they got different data formats. Yeah. They've got different data definitions. Right. There's no harmonization. I, I think, I think the problem is people. People are so guarded about what they do, and their job security depends on it. And no matter how good the idea is, if their job is threatened, they'll scuttle it. It's always, yeah. it's always been the problem of data ownership. Data, data is power, and yes. if, if, if the data, if someone else is taking control of your data, that threatens your power. But even if that weren't the case, you've got different objectives. You know, you, one part of the organization has to climb that hill, another one has to you know, cross that river. Right. And the hills and rivers Correct. require different tools and yeah. you know, different, different skill sets, right. and at the end, when you get to the end, it's like look, the data definitions are completely different. Right. So, so what do you do? If you're a business owner, do you say, okay, I, I've got a CDO who's telling me I need to use these standards. I look at it, but I have a, a, a target to hit. That's going to slow me down. Yeah. I've got more authority because I run the P&L, he or she doesn't. Yeah. I'm just going to go and I'll right. apologize you know, right. later. Yeah. And you end up with more and more complexity. And then right. it, it's, it's, like, like, you know, it's yeah. the equivalent of technical debt. Yeah. It's like data debt. Data, debt. Yeah, data yes, complexity, correct. data debt. I, you know, one interesting uh, light that went on when just uh, talking to people on the cube was when somebody was saying that you know when you collect metadata or you use an LLM to extract some entities and you cr uh, create a semantic layer of metadata, uh, that metadata is just metadata is sitting right there. A data privacy person comes in and says, "Oh, I am interested in seeing if there's any GDPR violation." The security person is looking at the same metadata and saying, I want to see if there's any PII information and some security breach that can happen. The ethics person is looking at it from a different angle. The CDO is looking at it from data quality angle. And they don't necessarily talk to each other. So now you've got disconnect and uh, the business needs to take that metadata and put it into production for some uh, outcome. But you've got like four, five, six different people who are coming at it from the different angles and not meeting uh, in the center. And I don't know if you got into systems of agency with Davenport, did you? No. Because he's the one who created the, when he had the systems of record, systems of engagement, mm -hmm. and I think he even, he even, he might have coined systems. Of, anyway, my point is, in order to have that, you've got to have this whole unified metadata model, hmm. um, or you're going to have that in pockets, yes, you need and that. you're going to yes. have agents. George yeah. gave a good example on a recent breaking analysis with, uh, he talked to Amazon, the, not the web services side of the business, but the other side of the mm -hmm. business who have different agents that do different planning, yeah. you know, planning agents, yeah. and they actually, um, have a highly automated way of forecasting what warehouses have to be built, and they forecast out five years, and 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 what infrastructure they're going to need down to the SKU, um, and you know how many SKUs they have, and try to forecast the sort of demand for physical warehouses, yeah. and then and then different agents do those things. Um, that seems to me uh, to be an extremely complex problem for a company that doesn't have the resources of yeah. an Amazon. Correct. Well, um, Amazon started life as a data-driven company. I mean, that's really a really good point. The data has always has been part of their cultural fabric since the beginning. Uh, much tougher if you're a 100-year-old financial institution. So this is, a, this is a really important point. Dave Michella made this, in, uh, this <coughs> point in, his, in his, one of his earlier books where these digital natives or internet giants, whatever you want to call them, they put data at the core and they put the business processes around that data, whereas you think about Coca-Cola, they've got you know, bottling plants and, and they've got processes are at the core and the data is sort of 
you know, an outcrop. Exhaust. The exhaust of all yes, the, those, correct, those operational process, systems. Correct. And the other thing that struck me is um, somebody had mentioned, uh, it might have been our last guest talking about, you know, you've got, you've got, yeah, you've got all these SaaS vendors. Hmm. You look at what Salesforce is doing with their data cloud. Yeah. They're basically saying, hey, we're going to worry about our little part of the world. We're going to solve this problem within Salesforce. That's a very viable hmm. strategy. We're going to actually do customer 360 just with what we have in, 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 in our CRM. And we're going to do the semantic layer and all that wonderful stuff. We're not going to necessarily help you with all your other data states. Yeah. But that's going to be very alluring to the person who's in charge of sales right. to say, well, this works for us. Right. Leave us alone. We're the most important function of the organization. Go figure it out on your own. Yeah. And that's back to the people. And Salesforce has spawned an ecosystem of third parties that work with that data cloud. Right. That, take, that, that add value to the data cloud by using the, you know, the, 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 taking advantage of the work that Salesforce has done to develop high quality, consistently governed data. And they can expand their TAM through integrations and, and other things so, that could disintermediate yeah. some of the wars that we're seeing between some of the data platforms. Yes, in fact, I think those wars are going to become even uh, fiercer. And why I say this is because with Iceberg, there is now a common layer of abstraction that anyone can take advantage of. It used to be that Salesforce had all the prospect data, so they would, uh, companies would extract Salesforce data into the object store like S3, read it into Snowflake, combine it with the ERP data, run some uh, calculations. Now Salesforce is saying, no, wait, we don't want to give up our data to Snowflake. So we will write the data in Iceberg and keep it in our managed data lake. Five Trend is doing the same. Yeah. Confluent is doing the same. Confluent is, was a managed Kafka company. Then they bought Flink, uh, managed Flink service. But, but the, all they're doing was messaging of data from source into S3 or Snowflake or Cloudera or whatever. Now they say, they're saying, no, we want to write the output in Iceberg and then you put these, you know, DuckDB kind of like engines on top, or Spark, or Pandas, and you just run your analytics. Why are you sending it to other places? So this battle between data platforms is only starting to happen now. It used to be Oracle and Teradata at one time, then Snowflake and Databricks disrupted. Now these two companies are themselves getting disrupted. The, I yeah. think the, the other interesting thing that I'd ask you guys is when you go back to the late 90s, Microsoft and the DOJ, you know, hmm. were going through their whole thing with, with the Windows monopoly. Um, there was no Google. I mean, people hadn't even probably heard of it by then. There was no Facebook, right? Amazon was there, but they were a bookseller. Now hmm. they're the dominant companies. Will there be, you would to say history would would suggest there will be some other emergence yes, of some yes. new applications yeah. that are that are data driven, whole new set of yeah. processes. David Floor is big on this. He thinks that that the way business processes are created, you'll have AI native business processes. Yeah, agents. Mm -hmm. Yes, that are agent driven. Correct. Um, th that that are, to your point earlier, if you're a hundred year old company, you have to reformat your processes or rethink everything. But if you do a f AI native processes, you're going to be a way more productive company. Yeah. And his theory is th there will be the next Google and Amazon and Facebook that emerge you know, so, from those companies. Yeah. It, it's, history has always Correct. done that. I, we are starting to see it already. Uh, OpenAI bought Rockset. Yeah. Although uh, OpenAI does not want to be in the database business, but now they own a database. So I think what's going to happen is, you know, we've had uh, the old traditional uh, players, then we've had Snowflake, Databricks. Now we're going to have OpenAI. We're going to have NVIDIA. NVIDIA is no, no longer just a chip company with CUDA. They are moving up the stack. We will have companies like Palantir. Yeah. Then we'll have a lot of, like, you know, we have digital native companies, AI, and AI native companies like Scale AI and all these companies that we don't even know exist, and they'll all be playing in the same space that old companies and new companies and emerging companies are playing. I heard the uh, CoreWeave CEO on TV this morning, I put out a, a tweet on it, and 
you know, that's another example yeah. of a company that could potentially disrupt yeah. the existing a, a cloud vast players. data. Yeah, right. And yeah. vast is actually, you know, supplies uh, core weave with their right. file that's system. True. So, yes. well, yeah. I, I, if you look at history again, Dave, uh, platform shifts always presage uh, power shifts. Right. And so it was, you know, the PC changed everything, the uh, uh, the network changed, the, the mm -hmm. internet changed things. And if you believe what people are saying, the gen AI is the next big platform shift, or AI is the next big platform shift, then likely the industry structure will be disrupted by it. Yeah. Yeah, and what's going to be interesting to see is, are these going to be, you know, brand new companies, yes, uh, for sure, or companies that were sort of on the cusp prior to the, the last wave, but now, you, you mentioned Palantir, you, you don't think about Palantir, or Salesforce is another example. Salesforce is hugely accessible company, uh, but they could, could they become you know, one of those dominant companies, you know, given that we talked about ServiceNow is another example. You know, very, very yeah, strong SaaS very companies good. that could, but could actually ascend to a, a higher level. Yeah. Or yeah. is it going to be a complete new disruption where the, the, the traditional CRM gets blown away by some you know, some right. much like simpler, much more cost Like microservices, you know, how we have microservices and applications, these agents could be, this is an AP agent, this is an AR agent, yeah. this Micro is a agents. GL agent, right? Yeah. Something like that? Micro agents. Micro yeah. agents. Yeah. Or, or, or is it the case that these cloud giants have such huge balance sheets and great management mm -hmm. uh, that they will get a startup mentality uh, or, or, and it also depends on the, uh, the, the M&A activity, whether or not that's even allowed, right? Uh, <laughs> Interesting data uh, point there. Gar topic. Gartner okay. just came out a couple of days ago with its uh, IT spending forecast for the last half of the year. They're predicting a 24% growth in data center spending wow. in the last half of the year. And they say that that is driven primarily by AI model training. Now, I think the conventional wisdom, and I have an appointment to, to talk to the analyst who, who produced this research, the, the conventional wisdom is this is all going in the cloud. I think what they are seeing is that a lot of it is not. It's going into the data center, and that could be, I'm not saying an existential threat, but that's something the cloud giants need to keep an eye on. Yeah, that's true. I, I, I do, I wonder um, about, because the data we have suggested IT spending you know, three, three to four percent. Yeah. I mean, it's not, it's not the, like Gartner was at seven, eight percent, IDC was at seven, eight percent. I'm like, well, where are you getting this data? I, I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I don't see that when I talk to customers, hmm. you know, generally speaking, and we, we do these surveys pretty regularly, but, but I do believe if you isolate it to, you know, kind of the, what's happening in the NVIDIA ecosystem, that those kind of numbers are, I mean, we're in a super cycle for data centers, for sure. Uh, and all that's going to lead to just more data. Um, mm -hmm. more complexity. The, more the, users, the, more yeah. use cases. Yes, yes, so, and, um, yeah. and, and you know, more confusion, and, yes. and, and a more difficult time governing it. So, yeah. I guess, like you said, that's great for consultants, it's great for right. analysts, and, it's great for media. And, and also, <laughs> it's great for complexity events. is the enemy of security. Yes. The more complex, so security company like Wiz got, you know. Yeah. We'll see if that goes through. Yes, right? correct. Yes. <laughs> the, these things have a, a way of getting leaked, right? Yes, Remember, Wiz yes. was going to buy Lacework, that died. Yeah, but yeah. what's that, $24 billion That's uh, potential the, acquisition? That's the rumor. I mean, that, yeah. that is huge news. Um, you know, it's funny, I, I just make a comment on that. Uh, the, the, the government likes to finger wag a little hmm. bit about security, but then at the same time, they'll stop potentially an acquisition like that. Google trying to, you know, with Mandy, the Mandian acquisition Mandian, and yeah. maybe buying Wiz, thinking about, wow, maybe we compete more effectively with with Amazon if we have a better security story. Mm. <laughs> and so, we'll see how that all Maybe plays Microsoft out. should buy a base. They yeah, that need, would never they happen, need right? more than <laughs> <laughs> Well, but hey, they've got a good security business, so. But, but I, the, the point is, those three companies are going to compete. Yes. Right? So, the, I don't worry about competition at that level. Yeah. Uh, I don't worry about higher prices. Uh, and sometimes I worry about bundling, too much power, we've seen that yeah. before. Uh, anyway, guys, awesome. Week. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming Welcome. to Cambridge. Thank you. Paul, Welcome. good to see you. You um, too, Dave, always. Okay, uh, thank you for watching. This is a wrap from day two at CDOIQ 2024. Check out theCUBE.net for all these videos on demand, siliconangle.com for all the news and thecuberesearch.com. We'll see you next time. This is Dave Vellante for Paul Gillen and Sanjeev Mohan. Thanks for watching.